Hey everyone, welcome back to Unveiling Dark Secrets. It's Wendy here. And today we're diving deep into a story that has haunted the small town of Canadian, Texas. We're talking about the mysterious disappearance of Thomas Brown, a case that's been shrouded in questions, theories, and a desperate search for the truth. From the night he vanished into thin air to the relentless efforts of his loved ones to find answers, we're uncovering every layer of this chilling story. You're in the right place. If you're fascinated by true crime and the unsolved mysteries that grip communities, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Give this video a thumbs up and ring the bell to stay updated on all my latest investigations. Now, let's unravel the dark secrets behind the disappearance of Thomas Brown. Canadian Texas is a small town in the northeastern corner of the Texas Panhandle. Rolling hills, prairies, and the Canadian River surround the town. Canadian is known for being the dreamers, entrepreneurs, and home of the ranchers. Some cool places to visit in Canadian are the Citadel Mansion, Palace Theater, River Valley Pioneer Museum, and the Canadian River Wagon Bridge. However, this small Texas town has a mystery that it holds on to, the disappearance of Thomas Brown. Thomas Brown, also known as Tom by friends and family, was a popular and well-liked senior high school student. He excelled both academically and athletically, being named class president for two consecutive years and playing as an offensive lineman on the football team. Tom had a wide range of interests, including reading video games and wrestling. He was described as funny and friendly, always there to make others laugh. Tom lived with his mother, Penny, his stepfather, Chris Meek, and his older brother, Tucker. Despite a difficult breakup with his girlfriend and some setbacks in his personal life, Tom appeared to be in good spirits leading up to his disappearance. On Thanksgiving Eve in 2016, Tom asked his mom, Penny, for her debit card so he could fill his Durango up and then headed out to meet with some friends. He went to the middle school parking lot where he met Caleb King and Michael Castletine. They drove around town and then went and ate at Alexander's. At approximately 8 p.m., they went back to the middle school parking lot and met up with Christian Webb. Michael had said he was going to head home, and Caleb and Tom got into Christian's silver Dodge Charger. Christian had already graduated the year before and was home for the Thanksgiving holiday. At some point, they all ended up at the town folk, the Walking Bridge, which is an old wagon bridge located just outside of town. Tom was wearing a thin black pullover a black Canadian Wildcats t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes on this cold, breezy night. Between 11 and 11.15 p.m., they all returned to the middle school parking lot. Caleb headed home, and Christian and Tom hung out a little longer, making plans for him to come over to Christian's the next day. At midnight, Penny looked at her phone and saw what time it was. Tom's curfew was midnight, and he was very rarely late. The few times that he had been late or knew he was going to be late, he would call and let his mom know. She started calling Tom and texting him, but there was no response. At 12.30, she woke her husband, Chris, up and told him the situation and that she was going to go out and look for him. Tom's brother, Tucker, and his friend, Taylor, went out and helped to look for him also. After an hour... Tucker dropped Taylor off at his house and went out to continue to look for his brother. Taylor called Caleb King and asked him if he might know where Tom would be. He had no answers and called Michael and Christian, who also had no answers on where Tom would be at. All three of Tom's friends decided they would each go out and help look for him. They searched the football stadium downtown in Lake Marvin, but there was no sign of him. Thanksgiving morning around 2.30 a.m., Penny, Tom's mother, contacted the sheriff's office. Deputy Pine Gregory was on duty that night. He also drove around looking for Tom's Durango. At approximately 4.30 a.m., Pine pulled up to Tom's home. Penny, Chris, and Tucker met the sheriff on the front porch, hoping for some news. Tucker and Pine decided to head over to Tom's ex-girlfriend, Sage Pennington hoping that he would go over to her house since she was home for Thanksgiving. The Red Durango was not there. At 7.30 a.m., Penny and Chris went to see Nathan Lewis, 
who was the sheriff of Hampel County. Nathan Lewis had never dealt with a missing person case, but here he was talking to Tom's parents about where he would be. Nathan and Penny knew each other, but were not friends. In fact, there was a situation in 2015 between Tom and Nathan that caused a little bit of drama. When the red Dodge Durango was finally located under some trees on a dirt road just north of town, it raised more questions than answers. Tom was nowhere to be found, and the vehicle seemed to be in an odd location. Footprints and a fresh urine mark near the truck indicated recent human activity, but Tom's belongings, including his keys, wallet, and phone, were all missing. One thing they did find was a 25 caliber shell casing on the floorboard but no signs that a gun had been shot in the Durango. With the news of Tom's Durango being found, the whole community gathered together on horseback, foot, and four-wheelers to search for Tom. Also, two helicopters hit the skies to help in the search. Game wardens showed up with tracking dogs, but no sign of Tom anywhere. There was so much confusion and heartbreak on what possibly could have happened to Tom. As Thanksgiving Day progressed, so many people dropped by the family's house and brought food, words of encouragement, and prayers. Sheriff Lewis even dropped by stating they were going to bring the Durango back because they were done with it. Penny was quite upset because she could not figure out how the sheriff's department could have possibly fully processed the vehicle for any evidence. The sheriff stated again that he was done with it. Tucker decided to do his own search and examine the Durango when it arrived back home, and he still found nothing. However, the next morning, Lewis called Penny, wanting the Durango back to make sure everything was processed completely and accurately. The school superintendent had asked Penny if anyone had seen Tom's school laptop computer and wondered if it could have been tracked if anyone used it. However, Tom kept his laptop in his backpack and always left it in his vehicle unless he had homework. The backpack and the laptop were missing along with his other personal belongings. The tracing attempts on the laptop were unsuccessful, unfortunately. There was so much confusion and more questions arising as everything was coming out. Tom's family and friends knew that he was not an outdoorsy kind of person they knew that he would not just park his vehicle under a tree and go for a walk in the middle of the night. Sheriff Lewis amped up the search efforts for the next few days. He had bloodhounds start at where the Durango was found, and they followed a scent trail to a marshy area and lost the scent. He set up a grid search that covered a two-mile area around the water treatment plant. He had a team of people on horseback that started at the Canadian River and to Lake Marvin. No signs of Tom anywhere. The Sheriff's Department decided to start searching through security cameras to help determine a timeline and maybe see if anyone was with Tom or if he was by himself. What they found was a security camera at a convenience store on 2nd Street that showed the Red Durango headed up the street right after midnight and then coming back down the street a few minutes later. At approximately 5.30 a.m., another video showed the vehicle driving downtown and then backtracking. There was no point of direction or purpose for where the Durango was going. Near the water treatment plant, the Durango was seen on video slowly driving down a dirt road through the gate of the water treatment plant and then parking. This was at 5.56 a.m., the headlights of the vehicle turned off and no one was seen getting in or out. Tom's mother, Penny, decided to put the thought out that maybe Tom had committed self-passing away. It raised red flags for Deputy Lewis because why would she first think of him self-harming himself? He asked Penny, why was that the first thought that came to mind? Her response was, self-unaliving ran in her family. After talking with Penny, she soon changed her response to maybe he didn't, self-unalive. He never showed any signs of depression or distress. This would not be the last time the sheriff's department would talk to Penny. Some things came out about Tom that were a little bit concerning and caused the feeling that Penny was withholding information. 
Tom's ex-girlfriend had told a deputy that Tom enjoyed wearing men's diapers and that he was a little embarrassed about it. When Penny was confronted with this information, she became upset and felt people were trying to tarnish Tom's reputation. She claimed to know nothing about this little rumor. At this point, Penny decided to hire a private investigator. She felt that Sheriff Lewis was too inexperienced in the missing persons department. Penny called up Philip Klein, who had quite a bit of experience in missing persons and a high success rate. When Philip arrived in Canadian, he got right to work on meeting the family and Deputy Lewis. The PI and the sheriff did not hit it off at all. He questioned Tom's friends, classmates, and family. There was not much new information that Klein got. He did feel that self unaliving did not happen, mainly because a body had not been found. Why would someone fill their gas tank full before doing that to themselves? And why would someone take their personal belongings with them? It just didn't make sense. Klein began suggesting that Tom was kidnapped or murdered. He came up with this elaborate narrative of maybe Tom got involved in some kind of sexual fantasy group, sexual fetish group, or some other outrageous group. Maybe he got involved with the wrong people and they did something to him. Another story that Klein told Tom's friends is maybe he met up with someone he knew right before midnight and things went wrong. Maybe there was a fight that happened and ended badly. So the person killed Tom and dumped his body somewhere and then parked the Durango where it was found. Klein sure did stir up the town with his dramatic theories and suggestions. He soon brought in another private investigator named Jane Holmes. They both decided to question the football team, wondering if some of the players bullied Tom for quitting the team. They all denied any bullying and stated they accepted his quitting. It was his decision. The Hemp Hill Sheriff's Department decided to call in their own reinforcements. They contacted the FBI and Texas Rangers to help with the disappearance of Tom. They honed in on a statement from one of Tom's friends. Tom once discussed with his friend how easy it would be to just disappear. Maybe he decided to disappear. It still didn't make sense. Why would he make plans with his friend Christian for Thanksgiving Day? They did question Penny about Tom's sexuality. Penny was stunned and offended that they thought that he might be gay. She was offended that his friends and classmates would think that Tom was gay and wanted to know who was saying that. Of course, the law enforcement was not going to tell her who had mentioned that. No matter his sexuality, the issue was there was no sign of Tom anywhere, no digital footprint at all, and no physical evidence. Tom had vanished without a trace. Two months after Tom's disappearance on February 1st, 2017, the youth pastor of the First United Methodist did a prayer vigil for Tom. The high school gym was packed with over 100 people. There was a lot of emotion in that gym that day. Songs were sung, prayers were said, and the community came together. The next day, someone found Tom's backpack on a farm-to-market road east of Canadian. The person who found the backpack was a worker for an electric company. He saw the backpack sitting under a tree behind a barbed wire fence. When he looked in the backpack and saw that it was Tom Brown's, he set it down and went straight to the sheriff's office. The contents that were in the bag were school papers, books, and the school-issued laptop. Sheriff Lewis arrived at the scene of the backpack and concluded that someone had purposely placed the backpack under the hackberry trees. There was no way someone could have thrown the backpack from the road and it landed how it was found. The disappearance of Tom just became more mysterious and confusing. After Tom had parked his Durango at the water treatment plant at 6 a.m., he would have to walk nearly four miles through the early morning darkness in the thin clothing. Remember, it was a cold night and morning in the 30s, I do believe. He would have walked through marshy areas, the Canadian River, and acres of tall grass. There were other ways he could have gone to get to this point, but it would have taken longer and people would have already been looking for him. As the news of the backpack being found, more rumors started. The private investigator stated that this was proof of foul play. I think Klein was only looking to cause drama and try to convince people he was the best of the best. He was able to do that. 
he went on radio talk shows and talked about the Tom Brown case. It was getting national attention. He truly felt that something bad had happened to Tom and the sheriff's department was trying to portray that Tom was a runaway. It made more sense that something bad had happened because why would Tom leave with no clothes, no vehicle, no money, and just disappear? Klein's theory of foul play started running rampant through town. And he had even stated on one of the radio shows that there were a few people who were being investigated as possible suspects. He knew there was someone out there who knew what had happened. Someone knows a lot more than has been told. No one came forward with any new evidence. Klein did bring a very respected dog handler. Trace Sargent, who had a very well-known cadaver dog named Chance. Trace took Chance all over town, places where Tom was last seen, Lake Marvin Road, where the backpack was found, and then back to Penny's home, where the Durango was. Chance circled the Durango and sniffed where the streak of blood was, which was confirmed to be Tom's. Chance sat down at the vehicle, which meant that the dog smelled death. However, Chance did not bring any new evidence. The small Texas town of Canadian wanted to know who the possible suspects were of Klein's. They started to come up with their own conclusions of who the suspects could be. They accused Michael Castletine because he had been cruising with Tom on Thanksgiving Eve. They felt that because he smoked pot and occasionally sold it, he was the one that hurt Tom. However, Michael had gone home around 8 p.m. that night, and it was confirmed with his mother that he was at home. In fact, Shannon was up till 2 a.m. painting and saw her son Michael come out of his room. This is when he had gotten the call about Tom and was going to go out and look for him. Another person who was being accused was Chris Jones. He was another classmate and a running back on the football team. A month after Tom disappeared, Chris was arrested for an assault charge. He had fractured another student's eye socket. At the time that Tom went missing, he was at the head football coach's house and went to bed around 10 p.m. Chris had claimed he had no interactions with Tom or anyone who might know where or what happened to him. The rumors and theories kept building throughout the town and even became more dramatized and crazier. No one knew what to think but there had to be someone out there that knew what happened. Sheriff Lewis was quite tired of the gossip that Klein was putting out. There was no physical evidence that any of the high school students had any part of Tom's disappearance. There was only one person their law enforcement was looking at as a possible suspect in his disappearance, Christian Webb. They had interrogated her for over four hours, telling her that she knew more than what she was saying. Her story never changed. Lewis was convinced that Tom had run off with another man, even though there was no evidence of this happening. Another teen that was being targeted was Caleb Keene. He was also with Tom the night he disappeared. Law enforcement interrogated Caleb and demanded that he knew something and was not saying anything. Caleb stuck to his story also. It had never changed. In July 2017, Penny decided to hold a press conference. She had felt that the investigation had stalled and nothing was being done. She stated in the interview that Tom was not a troubled teen. There was no evidence that Tom was, nor any evidence that Tom had self-ended himself. All she wanted was to see her son again. She wanted him to come home. However, that is not all Penny had to say, and I quote, I am grateful for all the work done by our sheriff's office, but I believe there were some assumptions made in the very beginning, which weren't based on facts and ultimately led to doing nothing, Penny said. We are beyond frustrated with the lack of new evidence or leads garnered. Navigating the various law law enforcement agencies has proven to confuse us, frustrate us, and leave us questioning much about the way the investigation began and has continued. We need answers. She had pretty much lost all faith in the sheriff's department. Sheriff Lewis was at the conference and was a little dumbfounded by what Penny had just said. He felt he needed to make his own statement. And I quote, we have not forgotten Tom Brown. He said, we will not forget Tom Brown. 
we will do everything in our power to find Tom Brown. And we have not given up, nor will we. Right now, we have no evidence to say that anything else has happened. We have no evidence showing that a crime has been committed. And so at this point, he is missing. Now, Mr. Klein was not at this press conference, but he sure did hear about what was said. So, of course, he had to put his dollar's worth of comments in. He went back on Chris Sample's talk show and had quite a lot to say. He wanted everyone to know that his theory was that someone murdered Tom. He feels that the murder took place at the football stadium around the midnight hour. He also said, and I quote, We think it probably wasn't a premeditated switch situation. Klein told Samples, it was probably a situation where something happened. He ran into some friends or he ran into some frenemies or some enemies. And then it was a situation that got out of control. Maybe it was a simple little fight between two people and one punch landed a death blow. And then they had to cover it up, said Klein. And without going into the evidence, I will say we have about three persons of interest that we are focusing on. We're trying to talk to these three young people and say, look, just tell us what happened. Just give us the information and tell us where he is. Of course, Klein would not give any information, though he did say that he was planning on a massive search in Canadian. This once again got the town riled up and people in Canadian felt that Klein had new information. I am going to put in my two cents worth about these two individuals, Klein and Deputy Lewis. It seemed that these two were competing nearly. Not let's work together and find out where or what happened to Thomas Brown. This case has been a complete mess so far. Anyways, let's carry on. In the early fall of 2017, Klein had received a tip from who he called a very fine young person. This tip was that Tom's body would be found somewhere close to where the backpack was located. Klein decided to get together a large search party to start looking off Lake Marvin Road. He was able to gather around 150 people. He told the volunteers to look for human bones and personal belongings like Tom's iPhone, glasses, keys, and possibly a small caliber handgun. Just a few minutes into the search party, someone had found a phone in some grass. The crazy thing about this phone was that it was in near perfect condition. There were no scratches, cracks, or any other wear on it. And there was no dirt in the buttons or speaker holes. The grass had also been recently mowed and there had been recent rains. How could this be Tom's phone? It was given to the sheriffs and then would be sent off to the forensic lab for analysis. The search continued and other volunteers found shreds of deteriorated clothing, a shoe, and an empty pistol case. There were no remains found at this time. In November of 2017, Klein had stated that he had got another tip. There had been a brown or copper-colored Ford F-250 truck that had been rolling around in Canadian that night of Tom's disappearance. Klein stated, if anyone knew who had a truck of this color, please reach out. Klein had also decided to process the Durango again. He felt the sheriff's department had not done a thorough test. The Durango had been sitting in Penny's garage since Tom went missing. Klein sprayed luminol on the Durango's interior and lit it up like a Christmas tree, which means a large amount of blood was detected. There were so many outrageous rumors going around that I am not going to talk about, but want to just say some of these stories were quite made up and ridiculous. The town of Canadian was passing these stories around and making them bigger and bigger. Some of Tom's friends were being harassed and put right in the middle of the rumor mill that was going on. Nothing ever came of these rumors, but people sure liked to talk. On January 12, 2018, the forensic analysis on the iPhone that was found came back, and it was Tom's phone. This news was a major bombshell. This meant that someone had held onto this phone for nearly a year and then decided to dump it out by where the backpack was found. This also raised red flags for Klein. He knew that he had made sure to tell no one about where the search was going to be, except for the sheriff's department 48 hours before it was set to take place. Klein and his staff felt that someone in law enforcement had placed that phone out there. 
How else would it have gotten there in the shape that it was in? Was Deputy Lewis involved in the disappearance of Tom, or was he covering for someone? Klein had major issues with Lewis. Lewis was uncooperative and unwilling to help with anything. For instance, when the cadaver dog was in town, Lewis refused for the dog to sniff the backpack. He also did not fully process the Durango when there was quite a lot of evidence in there. Lewis responded that he felt that Klein was a joke and would just spread rumors around when there was no evidence of foul play. Tom had just run away. Neither of them supported the other in finding Tom. They both were suspicious of each other. Penny had been at a meeting at the sheriff's office and Lewis told Penny, and I quote, I said, you know, it's kind of strange that your investigator calls this search and lo and behold, right after he starts this shirt search, a cell phone is found. I said, isn't that strange? This accusation caused Klein to flip out and demand an apology from Lewis. Klein said, and I quote, in my 31 years in this business, I have never been accused of planting evidence, Klein told me. I mean, come on. Why would I risk my reputation and career to do something as stupid as that? It's just silly. It's just beyond silly. Klein wanted to know how he even got his hands on Tom's phone. Lewis, of course, had a response to this. Penny had the phone all along and gave it to Klein to place it before the search. Now, it is speculated that Penny reached out to Caleb's mother and asked if Caleb knew Tom's phone password. When asked why she needed the password, she stated that she received a request from the chief deputy wanting to know what the phone password was. It was speculated that Penny did have the phone and wanted to get into it to read text messages and call history. If this was the case, how did Penny get Tom's phone? Does she know something that she isn't telling? I don't know what to say about the iPhone situation. All I know is there is red flags and questions. In January 2018, Penny made an online petition to have a state law enforcement take the case. She was truly unhappy with how everything was going. Within 24 hours of this petition, she had 5,400 signatures. Lewis was tired of being slandered and harassed, so he did reach out to the Attorney General's criminal unit to take over the case. They agreed and sent two veteran investigators, Sergeants Rachel Kading and Chris Smith. Investigators arrived in Canadian. They got straight to work. They interviewed residents and studied reports and digital files, including call records, photos, and videos. What they came up with is someone knew something and they had a list of people. Kading and Smith met with these people on the list and also gave lie detector tests. A few that were on the list were Deputy Lewis and Klein, but first was Penny and her husband, Chris. In February 2018, Penny and Chris arrived at the Attorney General's office in Austin, Texas. She brought with her a timeline and a breakdown of the case. Kading and Smith sat down with Penny and Chris and went over the case. At the end of the meeting, the two investigators mentioned the lie detector tests that were going to be done in Pampa, Texas, at the Department of Public Safety Office. Penny and Chris were all for it. They had nothing to hide. March 2018 is when the test was scheduled. A few of the questions that were asked were if Penny had been communicating with Tom and if she had moved Tom's body. After the test was complete, Kading and Smith entered the interrogation room and started bombarding her with questions and accusations. They did not tell her the outcome of the lie detector test. They accused her of knowing where Tom's body was and that she was trying to cover up that he had self-ended himself. Maybe she was embarrassed that he had done what her father had done to himself in 1998. Penny was quite adamant that they were very wrong in their ridiculous theories. They even went as far as accusing Chris and Tucker of helping Penny move Tom's body. Tucker refused a polygraph test at that time. Next up for a polygraph was Deputy Lewis. Lewis was asked if he was involved in the disappearance of Tom Brown. He said no, and that was found as deceitful. Lewis was quite upset with the results. He was adamant that he had nothing to do with Tom disappearing. The last one up for the polygraph was Klein. Kading and Smith asked several questions about the discovery of the cell phone. Klein passed all the questions as telling the truth. Kading and Smith continued investigating, interviewing people, and revisiting alibis. 
They were getting nowhere as with everyone else that had been involved in investigating Tom's disappearance. Penny went onto Sample's radio show and said the investigators could not tell her anything and they were very tight-lipped. They were working hard. On January 9th, 2019, one of Lewis's deputies, Pine Gregory, parked his patrol vehicle at the very end of Lake Marvin Road, 12 miles from where Tom's cell phone had been found during Klein's search. Gregory was on duty, but he had taken a break to hunt for antlers that had been shed by deer which he collected. Gregory stepped out of his truck and followed a deer trail west, away from the road, for about 200 feet. He walked toward a group of trees and he saw something white lying under this group of trees. As he gets closer, he notices that it looks like a bone. When he approaches, he sees what it appears to be two eye sockets and some teeth. At that moment, he went back to his patrol car and called Deputy Lewis with the news that he had found a skull. 2019, two years and two months after Thomas Brown went missing, parts of his body had been found. When Deputy Lewis arrived at the scene, he and a few other deputies started searching the grounds around where the skull was found. This is the moment they found a femur, smaller bones, tennis shoes, shreds of blue jeans, and part of a Texas driver's license. The license had been chewed up a little bit by animals, but they were able to make out the name of Thomas Kelly Brown. Two years and two months, the community of Canadian Texas was able to have a memorial for Tom Brown. They held this memorial at the high school gym because of the amount of people who came to say, welcome home, Tom, welcome home. Tom's remains were sent to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification in Fort Worth. They were able to identify that the remains were Tom's, but were not able to complete any toxicology tests or cause of death. There were no fractures or bullet wounds in the bones that were provided. Unfortunately, there were still no answers to what happened to Tom. Did he do this to himself or did someone do this to him? Of course, the rumors continued and the speculations got bigger. Two weeks after Tom's remains were found, Jeff Castleton, the father of Michael, was found in his car at the rodeo grounds, deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He had been cleared from having anything to do with Tom's disappearance because he was at a concert the night Tom went missing. Now, some say that Jeff was having relations with Tom and was heartbroken when he was found. However, that was not the case. Jeff's family had said that he suffered from depression and bipolar, and he also had been quite sick and was not able to breathe. The finding of Tom's remains did not help all the accusations and the theories that the town was saying. Tom's friends were constantly accused and harassed along with their family. The community was afraid and grasping at any kind of theory to help them feel better. In August 2019, Katie and Smith decided to have an invite-only meeting. Penny, Chris, and Tucker, along with a few of their friends, came. Tom's father, Kelly Brown, along with his pastor and a few family members, also came. Klein and Jane Holmes were also there, along with Sheriff Lewis and a few deputies, all showed up to this meeting. Hempel County District Attorney and a Texas Ranger who had worked on the case had arrived at the meeting. Katie and Smith explained that they were pulling out of the investigation for now because there was no evidence of foul play or even a legitimate suspect. They had hit a dead end and could not move any further as of right now. Katie explained that she would check Facebook daily and keep track of all the local gossip. She stated that all the rumors that people were spreading had complicated and compromised the investigation. There were no credible explanations for all the questions that the, that the community of Canadian had. Kading went on to say, and I quote, We don't know if he parked his car there and he walked all the way. We don't know if he was with somebody else and they dropped his car off there and laid him to rest where he was laid to rest. We do not have evidence that leans one way or another. He could have died from natural causes for all we know. The only thing that Kading could say is that the lab technicians who looked through Tom's phone did find that at 9.45 p.m., while Tom was with his friends, he did an internet search for suicide hotlines. However, no evidence that he called any of them. Penny was devastated and felt they were right back to November 23, 
2016, right back to square one. Now, Klein was still stuck on the murder theory, but Kading and Smith found quite a lot of holes in bogus claims in Klein's investigations. The luminol test did not show blood. It showed yellow paint. The only blood that was found in the Durango was a small smear on the driver's door. They also said that Klein's theories about a killer and not Tom had been driving the Durango around town that night were bogus and unfounded. The cell phone ping that Klein said pinged near the football stadium was debunked. Kading and Smith revealed that there weren't enough cell phone towers in Canadian to accurately triangulate anyone's location. Concluding someone's location based on pings was guesswork at best. Klein was not going to back down from the murder theory and decided to voice his opinion on his Facebook page. He was determined to find out who killed Tom and was not going to stop at anything to bring justice. The accusations on Deputy Lewis were also found to be bogus, and Lewis was quite happy with clearing his name. However, he did resign on November 15, 2019. With Lewis resigning, that did not stop the accusations and theories that Klein spewed. Five months after the Attorney General's Investigations Department pulled away from the case, it was rumored that Kading was back and possibly had new evidence. Klein was still talking about his theory and telling people he was looking for evidence to support his theory that someone murdered Tom. He was working hard on trying to get one of the boys to confess that Tom was murdered in the high school parking lot or that Tom was murdered and they called someone to help get rid of the body. Penny supported Klein's theory and said that Lewis had to have a hand in it. Whether he shot Tom himself or helped someone cover up the shooting and dispose of the body, she also stated that she just wanted the truth about what happened. Klein had decided that he was going to have a town hall meeting and let everyone know what he had and who he had as a sus suspect and witness. Are you ready for this story? Because it's something straight out of the movies, it seems. I mean, the story that Klein is spewing to the town of Canadian is so bizarre that the town is even doubting everything about Klein. I am going to quote Chris Sample's rundown of the story that Klein said because he makes it short and to the point. Chris Samples is the talk radio host that Klein, Penny, and even Lewis would go on and talk about the case. I quote, Try to get your brain around this one. This one is the latest shared by Philip Klein and his team of investigators last night. Sheriff Lewis and Deputy Pine Gregory pick Chris Jones, who's now in prison, up and they take him blindfolded on a 30-minute drive. When they get out to wherever they were, they remove the blindfold and Joan testifies that he sees out in front of the car the day after Tom Brown went missing, Tom Brown tied there in front of the cop car. And former Deputy Pine Gregory has a gun to Tom Brown's head. Is that not the most bizarre thing? So Chris Jones was told by Lewis that he had to come play football for the Canadian Wildcats and then told him that he had to win or lose certain games. Supposedly, Lewis was involved in some gambling ring. When Chris did not do what he was told to do, Lewis loaded him up in his patrol car and took him to, out to see Tom. Wow. Just wow is all I can say. I just do not understand Klein and why he is coming up with these crazy stories. Does he not realize that the rumors and the bizarre theories he would spread hurt the investigation with the law enforcement agencies that were involved? There was absolutely no evidence that Lewis was involved in Tom's disappearance. In an interview that Skip Hollinsworth from Texas Monthly had with Rachel Kading from the Attorney General's Investigations Department, she had refused any kind of interviews until Klein came out with his Chris Jones and Deputy Lewis accusation. Skip had asked Kading, if there had been any evidence that Tom went to the football parking lot that night, he went missing. She said no evidence at all. He then asked Kading about Klein's newest theory. Kading said, again, no evidence. And Chris Jones has told many different stories over the years of this case. He is an unreliable witness. Kading also said, and I quote, I mean, 
the one that sticks out is he told the sheriff's office at some point that two Hispanic people in town were responsible for his death and that it was connected to the Mexican mafia or a cartel. These two individuals found out that he may know something about it, that they basically kidnapped him, strapped him to a chair, shot him up with drugs, and told him that if he ever told anybody, they would kill him. Kading investigated every story that came out and nothing was true. She did state that they do have a theory, but we're not going to put it out in public because it would be irresponsible of her to do so. Katie does feel that Tom's mother and stepfather knew a lot more than what they were saying. She mentioned the lie detector tests that were given back in 2018. She stated that both Penny and Chris Meek showed deception when questions were asked about their, where Tom's body was located. Another issue that Kading had with Penny was the iPhone situation. Penny had asked a couple of Tom's friends if they knew the password to his phone. This was before the phone was even found. If she did not have the phone, why would she need the password? The only reason she would need the password is, is if she had the phone all along and then planted the phone before the search took place. Kading added these questions to the polygraph test. Chris passed. But Penny, however, showed deception. Penny is very adamant that she had nothing to do with her son's disappearance and death. She is determined to continue the investigation and find answers, hoping that one day someone will come forward. She still employs Klein to continue to investigate. It has been seven years since Tom went missing. Seven years of no answers. Seven years of not knowing what happened to Thomas, an 18-year-old young man who had his whole life ahead of him. It has been five years since Tom's remains have been found. I pray that one day soon someone comes forward and comes clean. There have been so many stories and accusations that have run rampant through this small Texas town. No wonder there have not been any answers. What do you think happened? Do you think Sheriff Lewis had a hand in Tom's demise? Or what about Penny? Do you think she knows more than she is telling? Or what about this Chris Jones? Or do you think it was kids playing around and an accident happened and someone helped to cover it up? I will say that I truly believe that someone in Canadian knows what happened. Whoever it may be, I hope this eats at them until they have no choice but to come forward with the truth. May you rest in peace in Jesus' arms. Tom Brown. If you know anything about Tom, please reach out to your local law enforcement or the Hemphill County Sheriff's Department at 806-323-5324. Thank you again for watching this long video. I wanted to bring every detail I could find about this case to you. Please feel free to comment and subscribe. Until we meet again, stay vigilant, stay safe, and be blessed.